a reading from the book of Exodus. Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, leading the flock across the desert. He came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There an angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in fire flaming out of a bush. As he looked on, he was surprised to see that the bush, though on fire, was not consumed. So Moses decided, I must go over to look at this remarkable sight and see why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw him coming over to look at it more closely, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. He answered, Here I am. God said, Come no nearer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I am the God of your fathers, he continued, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. But the Lord said, I have witnessed the affliction of my people in Egypt and have heard their cry of complaint against their slave drivers, so I know well what they are suffering. Therefore, I have come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians and lead them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Moses said to God, But when I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, if they ask me, what is his name? What am I to tell them? God replied, I am who am. Then he added, this is what you shall tell the Israelites. I am sent me to you. God spoke further to Moses. Thus shall you say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. Thus am I to be remembered through all generations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord is kind and merciful. The Lord is kind and merciful. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all my being, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. The Lord is kind and merciful. He pardons all your iniquities. He heals all your ills. He redeems your life from destruction. He crowns you with kindness and compassion. The Lord is kind and merciful. The Lord secures justice and the rights of all the oppressed. He has made known his ways to Moses and his deeds to the children of Israel. The Lord is kind and merciful. Merciful and gracious is the Lord, slow to anger and abounding in kindness. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so surpassing is his kindness toward those who fear him. The Lord is kind and merciful. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all of them were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from a spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, for they were struck down in the desert. These things happened as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil things as they did. Do not grumble as some of them did, and suffer death by the destroyer. These things happened to them as an example, and they have been written down as a warning to us, upon whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, Whoever thinks he is standing secure should take care not to fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Repent, says the Lord, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Some people told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with the blood of their sacrifices. Jesus said to them in reply, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were greater sinners than all other Galileans? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish, as they did. Or those 18 people who were killed when the tower at Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than everyone else who lived in Jerusalem? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent... You will all perish as they did. And he told them this parable. There once was a person who had a fig tree planted in his orchard. And when he came in search of fruit on it, but found none, he said to the gardener, For three years now I have come in search of fruit on this fig tree, but have found none. So cut it down. Why should it exhaust the soil? He said to him in reply, Sir, Leave it for this year also, and I shall cultivate the ground around it and fertilize it. It may bear fruit in the future. If not, you can cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When I was a young college seminarian, I remember, I was with the Salesians, I remember being brought to a a group of sisters, the whole community was visiting with them, a very old and wise sister, very holy woman, and she said to us, young teenagers we were, if you want to be saints, do quick, do quick. And that sense of urgency is conveyed in the readings today. Hurry up. Repent now while we still have time, while we still have a desire to turn to God. Repent now. Make the decision for holiness today. Change without further delay. This is what Lent is meant to do, to stimulate in us that urgency of repentance. Otherwise, the tree will be cut down. The gospel passage is meant to convey both the urgency and also the patience of the Lord. He gives us time to repent. He gives us grace to repent. He gives us messages and readings and times of prayer and retreats and days of of recollection and devotionals and, 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 and various different nudges of grace. But if we keep ignoring them, if we keep pushing them aside, if we keep saying we're too busy to tend to the spiritual renewal that we need, after a while, these opportunities won't come back. After a while, even if they do, we're going to say, oh, I'm tired of paying attention to that. Do quick. Be holy. We all have an urgent need to repent lest we perish. The Lord Jesus says, This Lenten season is another opportunity for us to repent, brothers and sisters, and turn to the God who saves us. And the lessons from the Old Testament come across to us vividly today. Moses is called to set his people free, and Moses is a foreshadowing of Christ, right? He is the one that we look at And he himself said, a prophet like me the Lord will raise up so that you can listen to his voice. A prophet like me. In what sense? Scripture tells us in the book of Exodus that Moses spoke to God not like other people, 
but face to face as a friend to another friend. And Jesus, of course, is the only one who is the only begotten Son of the Father, an intimacy, a oneness with the Father that nobody else has, he and the Holy Spirit, of course. So Moses is a foreshadowing of Christ, not just in that intimacy that he had with God, but in the mission of saving the people. Now there is, by the way, a portion of the reading here that is not conveyed, because when these readings are put into the lectionary for the sake of time, sections are, are often um, skipped. And we hear Moses being called by God through the burning bush, and God says, I want you to go to Pharaoh, set my people free. And a verse we didn't read here is the verse that says, Moses turned to the Lord and said, why are you choosing me? Who am I? Notice he didn't say, oh Lord, good choice. I was going to apply for the job myself. No, Moses said, what, what, are you, what are you calling me for? I don't know what to do. And yet we know God accomplished the freeing of his people. What this tells us, of course, is that when God wants something do, done, he specializes in choosing those who don't know what they're doing. And that should give you confidence in the call that he gives you, starting with the call to repent. But the people were set free from Egypt because God is a God of salvation. I have heard the cry of my people who are being oppressed. Now, he hears the cry of his people who are being oppressed. And the first oppression he's talking about here is not slavery in Egypt. It's slavery to sin. That's the oppression that he is setting us free from. His call to repentance is not just do as I say because I'm in charge. It's I love you. Therefore, I want to set you free from the sin that is oppressing you. That's why it's such a false and superficial view of love that says to people they don't have to repent, they can just stay the way they are. A love that doesn't challenge them to see the sin in their own life. It's not love because it's letting the person be destroyed. When we understand sin and how it destroys us, we're going to look at the people we love and we're going to say, repent. Set yourself free from that. Let God set you free because that sin is destroying you. Because I love you, I want you to be free from it. That's how the urgent call to repentance and the love of God are two sides of the same coin. And so in our dealings with others, it's the same way. A pastor who never calls his people to repentance, he doesn't love them. He's letting them be destroyed by the error and the sin in which they may be in intertwined and enslaved. I have heard the cry of my people who are being oppressed. That is always the case with God. He hears us under the oppression of sin and death. He sets us free in Christ. He hears the weak and the lowly. He hears the people in various parts of the world who are in distress. We pray, for example, for the people of Ukraine. He hears the cry of his people in the womb, the children being oppressed by the violence of abortion, the threat of abortion. He hears all his people. He sets them free, revealing his name to Moses, I am. And this is very interesting because later in the book of Isaiah, when God is setting the people free from Babylon through King Cyrus, he, 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 he allows them to come back to the Holy Land, to come back to Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple. He said to Isaiah in that passage, I am the Lord, there is no other. He repeats this name of his, I am. And then in John chapter 8, let's go there briefly, Jesus does the same thing, again in the context of what? Of salvation. John uh, records this dispute between Jesus and the Jews about Abraham. And they said to him, the Jews that were listening, we are sure you are possessed, they said to Jesus. Abraham died and the, the prophets died, and yet you say, whoever keeps my word will never see death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died or the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? And then a few verses later, Jesus says, Amen, I say to you, 
before Abraham came to be, I am. Anybody ever wonders if Jesus claimed to be God? There's one of the instances right there. He takes to himself the very name of God, all in capital letters there in the scriptures. John 8, 58, I am. Same thing we heard in the first reading today. From the burning bush, I am. In other words, I am here, Jesus is saying in this chapter in, in John, and he's saying here to Moses, and it is Jesus because he's the eternal son of the Father, I am. In other words, I am on your side. I am with you. I'm setting you free. I'm saving you. God is not just standing there as a, as a, as a dictator saying, repent of sin, repent of sin. No, he's reaching down into our lives with his almighty hand and lifting us up out of that sin. The command to repent, in other words, is a promise of, of God's power to do so. It doesn't just stand in a distance and tell us to do so. I am, he says. I am here for you. This presence was reflected in the second reading by the cloud. And the fire, the pillar of fire, the fire in the burning bush is a manifestation of God. And then the fire in that pillar of cloud that led the people through the desert. See, God called Moses through the fire in the bush. And then when Moses was leading them through the desert journey, the fire was still with them. There was a pillar of cloud and at night it was a column of fire. And Paul is referring it to, to us in this uh, second reading today from 1 Corinthians. And the cloud, you think about a desert journey, right? You want to be under a cloud. You've got to get some protection from the sun. You want the cool mist every once in a while. And the pillar of fire reminding them of who God is. And then he mentions the rock that followed them. Moses was told to strike the rock when the people were thirsty, and water came from the rock, symbol of Christ. The water flowing from his side on the cross, a foreshadowing of baptism, which does what? Sets us free from the oppression of sin. See how this all fits together. And then Paul, referring to a rabbinic tradition, says that that spiritual rock followed them on the desert journey. Was this some kind of magic? Was this superstition? Was this some kind of idolatry? No, no and no. The rock was Christ. This is before the incarnation. The rock was Christ, the eternal Son of God who has spoken through the prophets with His Holy Spirit. Christ, who, through whom all things were made. Christ with us then, with us now, setting us free from the dominion of sin. He's with us, so there's no room for delay. He's with us, so be confident that you can overcome your sins. He's with us, and He hears the cry of His people who are being oppressed, so be confident that we can save the unborn, we can save those who are under the terrible oppression of the culture of death. He's with us. So do quick and repent and be holy. Amen.